Uh, yeah, so today I've tried to put in three different elements to this, depending on what people of interest are. So I'll give a bit of a, an overview of how scientific advice and policy works at the very highest level of um, European Commission. I was fortunate enough to be seconded for three years as the European um, uh, master standard expert, master expert to master seconded expert to the science advising methods and unit. So I'll explain to you how that works. And what I'll be doing to make it more interesting, given uh, your interests here in uh, food systems, is I'm going to use the sustainable food systems as the example of how it actually works. So therefore, it can be both. And in there also, another thing I made sure on is, is research methods, particularly secondary research. How do we synthesize? good quality science from a large area and be able to present that to produce robust scientific advice and there's techniques that I've specialised on for a number of years which was why I was seconded over to the Commission in the first place. So there's those three elements throughout this so I'm not sure which ones you're most interested in um, but I'll go through the presentation and i um, happy to take questions on any of those. I've probably got more slides than I need so we need to think about when we take questions. We've got quite a few slides. Some of the slides I will just skip over because this was originally put together for a slightly longer talk. Uh, but if there's any things you're particularly interested in, do, do shout as we go through. But most of the questions would be better if I took them at the end. I will stay as long as I can stay on afterwards to take questions separately. Okay, so without further ado, high level scientific advice for the European Commission towards a sustainable food system for Europe. And that was a topic that the chief scientific advisors the EU decided themselves really needed raising up to the highest level for the European Commission and for European Parliament to consider. So first of all, let's explain what the scientific advisory mechanism is about. You may be familiar that certain countries, particularly the UK, has a system of chief scientific advisors. So in the UK we have a government chief scientific advisor and then you have one in each of the individual departments. It runs the network. In Europe, it tends to have a mixed system. We have a few chief scientific advisors. That's very much regarded as the um, Anglo-American model. And in many countries in Europe, they tend to use scientific academies as giving a trusted form of scientific advice. Very often in an informal, informal basis. So what we ended up with the European uh, Commission's model is a scientific advice mechanism based on a group of seven chief science advisors selected from across different countries in the EU. So not just one, because if you try to one, then there's pretty, pretty much bias in any one country, coupled also with a lot of the work to gather the scientific evidence is going to be produced by something called, is produced by something called scientific advice and policy by European academies. And this is a network of academies which taps into thousands of the top academics across Europe, and they receive a grant to do this work, even in Europe, I'd say, which allows them to collate information, which then is a, an evidence base for the chief scientific advisor to consider and produce their opinions. And making all this work all together is something called the sound support unit, uh, which has a, a member of the methods doing the layouts on managing projects, as well as um, helping to write some of the common side of things um, and a whole variety of things. It works. I had the great pleasure of working with these uh, top scientists. Uh, Rolf Hoyer, former director of CERN, which is great. It means we have occasional team meetings in CERN. <coughs> and then um, from, the, from the UK, Sir Paul Nurse, um, head of the Crick Centre. In, in London, to name just two of them. Type of things which um, has been produced as scientific advice by uh, the group so far, by the science advisory mechanism. First one we did was closing the gap, also known as the, um, the CO2, even the Volkswagen scandal, possibly unfairly. Um, the difference between CO2 testing in vehicles, in the lab test versus what you actually get on the road, and the scandal around that. We were the first, one of the first groups to produce a detailed analysis of what could be done in terms of policy terms to how to correct that. And the new methods that we now have, which have greatly reduced those issues, were partly informed by, by, by the group. Do work on uh, agrobiotechnology 
um, food from the oceans, plant protection products, pesticides, all of these are really knotty problems where the European Commission themselves have usually said we really need some independent scientific ad ad advice on this. And that is quite important. The group do operate um, as an as a, uh, independent, impartial advisory group. The process, the way it actually works in practice, is we tend to spend a lot of time in scoping out the question. You can come up with a topic, but and very often the College of Commissioners, <coughs> that's the um, heads of the Commission collectively, will say we want you to look at pesticides. Is the current system as good as it could be? And they may throw that out as a vague question. We then spend quite a bit of time, a few months sometimes, refining well, what exactly is, is in that that you want to look at and what can we look at scientifically within that. So we then go on to create, review and synthesise the evidence relating to that question which we've, we've helped define. Once we've got some re results, we go out to some stakeholder meetings uh, to see how that's actually going to land with the people it's intended for, plus NGOs and the, 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 the public are entitled to comment as well, of course. And then after all of that, you produce what in SAM terms is called a scientific opinion. It really means a, a recommendation. We've got all this scientific advice, and therefore we feel that you should do this in policy terms. So it goes quite a way into advising on policy quite directly. To make all this work, particularly the collate, review and synthesise aspects, we've, divided, we've had to devise methods which are going to be really robust. You can imagine the challenges we get with, with reviewing, say, safety on pesticides. We've got the NGOs saying we're, we're being far too lenient, and you've got the industry saying it's ridiculous, we're being far too stern, and uh, the lobbying and pressure, whatever you put out there is going to be going to be attacked. So we have to have really robust methods. I benefited from um, experience in the UK where we'd present briefings to uh, ministers and there would be an occasion where they'd say, well, actually, we don't like that result, but we don't care because we just can commission our own results with our own experts and come up with a totally different answer. And that, in the essence, is the nub of the problem. You have to have a robust method which will stand up to scrutiny. In, in, in those circumstances, you could say, well, actually, if you did do that, what methods are your experts going to follow? How are you going to select your experts? Has that been peer-reviewed? Are you using best practice to reduce bias? So within the SAM unit, we, we, we have quite a bit of time thinking about the science of developing scientific advice for policy. And the, the thrust of that really is about reducing bias and improving transparency. So we use a combination of approaches and one of the things we do is we always use a combination of expert elicitation, getting expert advice, talking to experts, combined with the literature. And when we say the literature, it's not just the academic literature, although that is the majority. We also greatly value grey literature, which may be on you know, US EPA website, for example, may already got really good guidance that's very similar to what we're looking at, which we can go to. Um, expert elicitation can be in many forms that we talk with the experts. And then we use quite systematic methods for transparent and comprehensive gathering of that information. So we're currently working on a paper writing up the really the best way to run a workshop in an unbiased fashion and record the information. Um, and literature reviews in particular, um, UK is very strong on uh, systematic reviews. Systematic reviews um, have their place, but they're often very, very narrow questions. So we use more like rapid evidence assessments, quick scoping reviews, as um, defined by the civil service, which um, I had a hand in developing the guidance for those. So it was, it was quite an easy shoe and quite an easy thing to transfer in to improve those standards. And there's been some very good European research done under the Eclipse project, <coughs> which looked at all the different ways in which you can gather evidence and it says what the pros and cons are, were they good, were they weak. And we worked with the Eclipse team to look at our methods and they were particularly pleased because we didn't just go for one method just in the literature or just in with experts, we did this iteratively. We started off with the literature, we used some meta-analysis to work out where all the top experts in the country are using some very clever software related to publishing. We go to the experts, 
we get some information from them, we do literature reviews, we go back to the experts, and then we do literature reviews to close the gaps in knowledge as well. So it's this kind of dynamic uh, process. And the fundamental principles about this is really what we're trying to do is get away from the idea of the black box, that you get a result at the end of the day. Scientific evidence says this. But very often with a standard literature review, for example, it's not entirely obvious exactly how you've got to that. So the principle is we call it a, it's a glass box, not a black box. And the sources of information, it's the many, not the few. We never talk to one, two or three experts. It's usually more like 20, 30, 40. And we go out of our way to find experts who <coughs> are only tangentially, oddly, interested in the topic from a very different angle to, um, to try to mix things up a bit. So we use different scientific disciplines um, where other people would be quite surprised that we, 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 we do that. So we, we look at stretchy, stretching views and opinions and outside outliers of opinions are just as valuable as the, cons as the consensus. Because of our science of knowing how bias develops, it's very important to get a diversity of disciplines and views in there. So that's overall the, 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 the approach which you follow. So that's kind of the background on um, introduction to the way the, way the uh, scientific mechanism works. And now we look at a particular topic. I'll take you through. Um, and this is every topic we've done. It's actually been done slightly differently, but following the principles. So this topic was unusual. Towards a sustainable food system for Europe, it was unusual in the idea came out very strongly from the chief scientific advisors rather than being asked to us from the European commissioners. And it probably grew out of the fact that we've been working on food from the oceans, pesticides, genomic, genomics uh, science as well, and other related aspects that we're realising that there really was an ambition to do something to tie all this together. <coughs> and what really motivated chief scientific advisors in the, uh, the, the, the meetings which we attended is They'd come across that there, there really are some challenges at the moment facing us in terms of sustainable food. There's a volatility of supply and prices. There's an anticipated increase in demand, 50% increase in demand uh, 2050. At current rates, that would also equate to a 70% increase demand for animal-based food. Um, there's issues around land. Over half the world's um, the vegetated land is already under agriculture, so we're already uh, coming up against um, land availability issues. And of course the big one's poor nutrition. 800 million undernourished, and interestingly, 2 billion over or badly nourished. There's probably as many people dying, if not more, from overconsumption of the wrong food than there are dying of shortages these days. <coughs> so, when you start to think about um, sustainable food systems, it's both forms of malnutrition. <coughs> yeah. um, environments, water stress, soils, biodiversity loss, pollution increase, about a quarter of all greenhouse gas emissions, at least related to food production. <coughs> and also, the group was aware of the waste or losses. We talk about few torches in the world. Bear in mind that approximately 30% of all the food <coughs> produced in the world is either lost or wasted. So this was our starting point. Yes, we really need to do something in this area. But it's clear that this isn't just a future problem. There's things we need to do to address the current failings to move towards uh, a future-proof system. And what we're really getting into here is it's one of our big uh, uh, transitions to a sustainable system that we have to make. So it really is a big global challenge, international dimensions. So, painting out such a big problem, uh, we better go and see what's already been done. We don't want to reinvent the wheel, so this is where the skills of doing the evidence reviews come in. You look at what's already been produced. So a colleague of mine um, co-authored um, a short report on this, I'll leave a link to later on whereby we um, searched for and took recommendations for effectively these are already existing reviews. So we've actually done a review of reviews. So each of these uh, studies, World Resources Institute creating a sustainable food future 
itself surveyed thousands of um, pieces of literature, academic literature, and developed its own model. Um, Food in the Green Light, European Environment Agency, excellent work, really well researched. <coughs> WRR, the Dutch, particularly uh, well advanced in this area of, of uh, analysis for, for sustainable food systems. Uh, many other examples uh, as well, including the European Commission's own recipe for change. So we actually pulled together all of these and did an analysis of what these were already telling us. In doing so, we realised that we really do have to refine the question. And to refine the question also involves us defining what we mean. And I've recently had these debates with DFID and DEFRA, the UK, UK departments, and they're also struggling, uh, well, struggling, they're also examining exactly what the boundaries of the definition, what do we mean? There is no standard definition for a sustainable food system. That is the problem. All those reports take a slightly different angle. So let's think about it. Let's go back to first principles. Food. A lot of the reports concentrated just on agriculture. But food from the oceans, we know, has massive potential. There's more biodiversity in the, in, the, in, the, in the oceans than anywhere else, and we're only using a proportion of it. So it's very important to, to look at that. And there's also the rise of novel sources, lab-grown lab -grown meat cultures, um, using all, all different sorts of uh, products which could, which could be used in the future, some of which may, may be due to breakthrough in the next 10 years or so, maybe sooner. Should we include healthy diets in sustainable food? Depends on your definition of sustainability. And what are the system boundaries? So some of the reports we noticed focus very much on production. So if you go back 15, 20 years, almost all the reports are focusing on production. And what we've seen is the reports have got more sophisticated over time, whereby they're looking at also um, the whole system, where we go from production to processing, uh, distribution, consumption, and including food waste. How do we tackle food waste? Go Science, UK government science report, was one of the first ones to, to, to really say we need to look at the whole, the whole system. So that begs the question, and we had to come to our own working definition to allow chief scientific advisors to move forward with a tangible approach to this. So this is some of the background thinking behind that. What do we mean by a sustainable food system? If I asked each of you in the room, you might come up with a different, different definition. So we had to go through a process, a rationale of what we were going to go with. Um, broadly, we can define it, define it in terms of robustness or resili resilience of a system to supply the food that we need. Um, should be something in there about within environmental limits, global limits. We can talk in ecosystem service languages if we like, and ecology boundary, ecological boundaries. Should we also be linking to sustainable development goals? European Commission and UK government are currently Make, pay much more attention to make sure that the policies are linked and particularly tie in with uh, development goals, those links are clear. And we come across one or two ones which we really liked in the odd publication. So there was one here that said, a good way to define the system is to say it's actually everything from the farm or the ocean to the fork or the bin, which is quite, which is quite, which is quite, uh, quite catchy. And that included elements of security of supply, meeting nutritional needs within planetary boundaries and doesn't detract from any sustainable development goals and contributes positively to, to many other, many sustainable development goals. Interesting to bear in mind, the reports have got more sophisticated over time and as the sustainability has come more to the fore of <coughs> people's considerations um, in these reports is we start to include three pillars of sustainability, social, economic, environmental, and inter intergenerational aspects much more, much more strongly. Um, in addition to those considerations, <coughs> chief scientific advisors also need to consider the context that you're writing in. A lot of the reports are global, and the one I'll show you with you as an example is a global example for wide repeal, but the European Ad Commission advisors have got to do this in the context of EU. So we're going to read everything in the global context because the trade is linked, the food system is global, but they've got to be able to put forward recommendations 
that talk to policies in the EU that can have a direct effect. Some of those policies may be for international development, but the focus needs to be on. So you get different stresses. So, for example, in the EU, there is the food sector overall is probably the biggest employer in Europe. So there needs to be words in there around effects on the economy um, and the sustainability of, uh, for example, farming and the food industry overall. So we could go on all day about this and discuss all the different aspects. Really good analysis done by FAO and um, for the UN looking at um, other ways of, of defining things graphically which take in the same things. But at the end of the day, we came up with a draft definition. Uh, this was in March, it may, have, um, it may have been tweaked slightly with the last group meeting, but it was an EU sustainable food system. It's something that provides nutritious and healthy food for all co current and future EU citizens. It does so in a manner that protects and restores the natural environment and its ecosystem services is robust, resilient, economically dynamic, the economic element I mentioned before, and fair, such that it's socially acceptable and inclusive. So what we're really talking about here is if you change the system, it's towards a just transition, a fair transition. It should not negatively impact any SDGs and should positively impact uh, several of them. So we decided to go for this holistic definition, the whole broad definition, global taking of information, making it relevant for Europe, recognising that <coughs> the whole system is connected. And you say, oh great, that's sorted. Not quite that simple. Going through all those lists of references, we talk about the SDGs, none of them refer to the SDGs in the same way. Some of them include, they link to the Stable Development Goals, the obvious ones in terms of zero hunger and responsible consumption and production. And stop. Others say, oh no, we also link with life below water and life on land as well. And if you look hard enough, you can actually find links with sustainable food system in probably all or almost all the SDGs. So clearly our understanding and links with the SDGs are kind of evolving over time and also subject to some debate. But nevertheless, you end up with some which are clearly impact, some that's not. So we decided to go for this flexible definition of um, should not detract from any, but should benefit as many as possible or several. So we reviewed uh, dozens and dozens of these top international reports, which are effectively summaries themselves. In some cases, they were summaries of summaries. So we weren't going, which is the opposite of going in looking at the academic literature low, we've been redoing the review of the reviews and we compared and contrast them, say what they were covering, and these were some of the, we selected as being potentially the most relevant. So when you do a systematic review, you usually score references for relevance, we use the same sort of thinking. We decided our criteria, um, and then we applied them and worked out which of these informed different areas. And what we found is there's a mass, a wealth of well-evidenced policy relevant recommendations already exists, and those are often matched with supporting <coughs> research needs and innovation needs that have been identified. And that does include the Commission's own Food 2030 initiative, which actually comes out very well in this report. Um, seems a very well balanced uh, approach, which is obviously very EU relevant. Um, what the scoping review did, it confirmed without a doubt all those concerns that was initially uh, identified by, by the group. The, the the pressing nature of the problem is very well evidenced, but as are six identified broad types of action which appear throughout these reports. There's action around sustainable intensification, action on food loss and waste, dietary changes, resilience robustness, accountability stewardship, and a call for more policy cohesion or integration. And this is a summary of saying all the different reports we looked at, how much they spoke, each report spoke to and informed <coughs> those particular areas. The reports we found were detailed and of high quality, and importantly, they largely confirmed, co converged in terms of their conclusions and recommendations. Some, as we've you can see, are broader, so they missed out some bits, but nevertheless, all their recommendations 
are broadly convergent. Each of them accommodate different regional differences, so we're allowing for that in our conclusions there. A lot of them work on sophisticated uh, models, and we had our expert, we got an expert modeler who, who worked on us with this, and he came to the conclusion that really the models could be far more transparent. The way the results of the modelings are produced could be much, much better done. But, you know, when we really dug down into it and quizzed them, we still didn't think there was anything that would undermine the validity of the results of the modelling conclusions. It's just that the way the modelling, the uncertainties in the model should be far more explicit than when your choices were made. Okay, and this was produced in a scoping review um, Whoops, myself and a colleague um, authored, and that's available on the, on the link there. So the main findings are, is actually all these reports, there's a great broad consensus, there's a synergistic coordinated combination of all those actions I've just mentioned needed to be, to be followed. It sharpens up in some to talking about accountability and stewardship of, of producers, lots of socio-economic things come to the fore in the more recent reports because there's a, final, there's a dawning people that we're actually having a pretty good understanding of what needs to be done, um, but the, the barriers may be more, more um, political and, 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 and social rather than massive scientific gaps. So overall the works came to the same conclusions, that there were solutions and they were often win-win solutions and they would apply to a variety of scales and involve a, a variety of, of, of players. And I've been talking in very vague terms up to now, so we get into the specifics so you can see what some of those are in a minute. Uh, several studies also recommended we should pay the true cost of food, that there is a failure of the market here. Externalities should be internalised whilst ensuring a fair, a fair transition. <coughs> Lots of calls within the European ones for establishment of an EU common food nutrition policy. And the EU's got close to this before, and it's going to be pushed greatly by the, this new generation reports coming out um, to try to get it to commit to a big European sustainable food policy. And the UK government is doing theirs in, in parallel as well. Conclusions. Whilst there is always scope to improve the science in all of these aspects, and that has to be done, nevertheless, the biggest remaining gap here that will result in high-level scientific advice appears to relate not to what needs to be done, because these reports all have the same formulas, or very similar formulas, they all concur. It's really how such a transition can be achieved. And this caused quite a bit of debate within chief scientific advisors. We had two social scientists on the group, no economists, and the rest of them are physical and biological scientists. And they said, oh, is it really science? And the social scientists got upset. But it's still a science, so that, 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 that's quite interesting. So this is the first big report where they're concluding that we really need to get into the uh, social scientists, humanities area as being the, uh, possibly the majority of the work going forward. I'll give you an example of one of the reports because I think it needs a bit of... Um, it's a very bad pun in this context of meat on the bones. Uh, a little bit more structure. Example of one of the reports. Um, World Resource Institute, 2018, for example, massive modelling studies, took years to do, thousands of references, lots of scientists involved. Um, did a global model up to 2050. Uses a wide range of scenarios. As I said, not terribly transparent on its selection of its uh, scenario, all of its um, choices, but nevertheless, um, it, does, it, does, it does acknowledge um, uh, that there are uncertainties. And what it comes up with is a menu of 22 options by which to achieve this transition to a sustainable food system to meet the growing demands. Uh, whilst avoiding deforestation and reforestering or restoring abandoned or unproductive or low productive land. All of this to help stabilise climate, promote economic development and reduce poverty. So this report is one that takes in everything in our definition and does it in the global context. So this is one of the broader ones. Just to give you a flavour of what can be done here. 
So it starts off, the world needs to close a food gap of about 56% from our current um, output in terms of calories. There are issues in just reporting on calories, I'll have to say, but nevertheless, uh, it looks as though um, from 2010 baseline to 2050, we would have to increase our food production by 56% of the <coughs> current standard to reach that. So how is that going to be done? So it paints some pictures. Number of courses, 22 actions. I'll go through this very quickly. First one is reduce growth and demand for food and other agricultural products. Most reports lead off with increased production. This report leads off with reduce growth and demand, reduce waste, one third, good heavens. Uh, shifting to healthy, more sustainable diets. The benefits in Europe and the US for that would be phenomenal. There is real concern of the um, stress we put on our health systems due to um, poor diet and a lot of that possibly linked to food industry and the domination of processed uh, foods in the diet, high sugar, high salt, high fats, etc. Totally un un unavoidable, necessary, um, picked out as being very significant. We've got terrible cases of where some of the poorest countries um, suffering with, um, uh, hunger in certain parts of the country and where they had rapid development and imported Western diet, that there's, there's an awful lot of illness, new illness being um, <laughs> uh, arising, despite the fact there's a lot more food available in the country. So it's a big issue. Second course, I'll just pick out a few of these to highlight. Increase food production without increasing agricultural land. So there's a whole series of things uh, there. I haven't really got time to go through them. Just really want to give you a flavour that is well thought, to, well thought out, detailed, and is global in context. The actual recipes vary for different parts of the world, and it fully recognises that some things will work well in other countries, some things will work much better in others. Protect and restore natural ecosystems and, and limit agricultural land, land shifting. Um, reforest abandoned <coughs> unproductive land, for example, conserve and restore peatlands, lots of things which we're talking about reducing carbon in the atmosphere and locking it in as part of this, <coughs> being the climate change impacts. Increasing fish supply um, links in with the, the work we've done previously on food from the oceans. Reduce greenhouse gases emissions for agricultural production, long list of items there. All of these obviously subject to um, particularly more, more research as some of these are, are big uncertainties with their exact effectiveness, but nevertheless the pathways are clear. Um, okay, and they conclude happily that this is all doable. This is all clearly within our reach if we have enough ambition. We should be able to feed in excess of 10 billion people and still live within uh, climate, um, planetary boundaries. And that's taken as in this particular report as ensuring that global temperature rise would be below 2 degrees C. And there's some quite interesting results that come out from this, some findings, is that because food production is in this trajectory where it is, is increasing and has been historically for so long, just by carrying on the current trends of increase, that that will close this gap by half. They conclude, therefore, that uh, the other half, or slightly less than half, can be achieved by reduced growth and demand for food and other agricultural products. So this deals with the food gap. This is possibly conservative with the new breakthroughs, possibly improvements in in agriculture, um, other food production. And that's, that's um, set out in summary in this one. The summary for the emissions gap, so we're looking at maintaining global temperature rise below two degrees C. This is a bit more complicated. We're currently, emissions here, they're related them all to agriculture because it's the dominant one. Emissions tr will triple by 2050 without productivity gains. But if you build in the anticipated productivity gains based on just historical uh, trends, expert group had to decide what those were. It's actually, the picture's not quite as bad as it sounds. What we need to get to at the end of the day is to achieve this uh, climate change is 
is the figure right the way down here. So this is greenhouse gas production reduced from this level to here. So unabated, it would go to here. New technologies, not new technology, but in, improved agricultural methods with, with uh, reduced CO2 is likely to um, bring down rates to here. Slowing and shifting growth in demand is believed could reduce. So this is changing over from animal products, for example, less animals, more, more uh, vegetables in our fruit and veg in our diet. Um, boosting food supplies is only small, but it's actually quite important for nutrition and reducing emissions from a whole series of, of, of or basket of other measures. And a big one here is restoring forests and peatland could offset remaining emissions completely. So not only could we get below the two degrees C, we could actually potentially get down to CO2 output figures similar to 2010 uh, um, if we had a, a re-greening strategy um, uh, that was effective. So this is obviously high level summary, lots of details in the report, but it gives you um, an idea of the scale and the scope and the fact that these things have been thought through and you do get some surprises of, of what's effective. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the, the drawdown project, which is how to reduce CO2. It takes a similar, similar sort of scenario approach, which is very engaging and concludes exactly the same, that the food system is a big player in reducing and uh, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. Okay. Um, just mention a few things that really make, you, you've, you've got to qualify all of that and say, these are models. They, they're based on massive assumptions. History shows us that they're often wrong. And particularly we have um, some things, potential impact of technology and innovation could suddenly take things off in a totally different direction. Some of them could be better, but there again, our climate change predictions of the effect on the environment might be worse. So there are lots and lot of uncertainties here. So you're best regarding these models as informing our, 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 our thinking, but setting out some sort of scale of action that we need to take that's going to have, like, have um, a significant impact, which, which might be sufficient. When you focus on Europe, we dig a bit deeper. There's some fantastic work done looking in the European uh, context on um, what can be done on the ground. You've got all the bottom-up schemes, cities and communities should not be underestimated. In Europe, there's a fantastic groundswell um, of tremendous initiatives. I've been to some of the, some fantastic conferences where communities are getting together. Cities are setting their own policies. There's, there's European network of um, uh, cities particularly in sustainable food systems. Community stuff at, at all scales um, could, could really be a very big factor. National programmes, Dutch in particular, UK possibly catching up shortly in terms of setting out some sustainable food goals. Hopefully the reports coming out from the Commission will, will, encourage, will encourage what we call the, the middle out, the copying of the good national strategies. And there are of course the top-down policies and regulations which can be EU and global, it would be great to have an overarching policy to help guide these, links with the UN, FAO, lo lots of other things um, at, the, at the different levels. And there's a lot of work being done um, by various universities, a lot of them in, in the UK actually, as well, and research groups of, of what the barriers are to doing that. Um, so this is from Policy Brief 31, European Observation on Health Systems and Policies. That's from City University um, uh, colleagues there. Starts to look at the barriers and how can we actually achieve these things locally. And they all show there are some challenges, but there's some really encouraging developments. Why we haven't moved quicker is a big uh, question. Come back to that in a moment. So coming back to what we started as a process, all that work I've showed you most of that was actually the scoping of what we needed to do. So the chief scientific, we presented all that was findings to the chief scientific advisors, and they had to ask themselves, okay, so if that's all the information we already have, scientific reports um, in this area, 
what is the thing that the chief scientific advisors can most usefully do? They started this project thinking they were going to identify a lot more scientific work is needed in a particular area. And they concluded that a lot of the science, whilst it all, all needs to be tightened up and improved, the big thing that needs to be done is to just start to, to, get, to get on with these things. We know very often what works. We know the direction. All the major reports conclude the same things. The Lancet report that came out recently got massive, a food Lancet report that came out got massive publicity. It was actually saying 99% the same stuff that the previous six reports had said. So we don't necessarily need more reports of that nature. We need to look at the social sciences and the humanities. So they had to ask themselves, what can the group do? What type of problems we face with? Are they complicated? Are they complex? Are they what types of uncertainties and what types of how urgent is it and how important? So yes, this is definitely urgent. Is the available scientific evidence sound and sufficient? We presented them with what, what there was. What type of science discipline would be the most useful? Is it more natural sciences? Is it more social sciences and humanities? And the report that went behind that, which we presented to the Chief Scientific Advisors, uh, is, is, uh, is here. Uh, a lot of our reports, quite odd, we don't actually put our names on them, and that's because when we worked in the Commission, we were subject to intense lobbying, so a lot of our work doesn't get, doesn't get referenced to us individually. So myself and Hirion Eikink uh, um, in the c c Commission uh, did a lot of that work with some excellent review work in from other, other colleagues helping us with that. Um, so what do we end up with? Uh, SAM, Science Advisory Mechanisms, Evidence Review and Scientific Opinion. This is still a scoping phase. We've not even started yet. And that took us a few months to do. We say we're sufficiently clear on what needs to be done to transition on a big scale for a sustainable transition to Europe. And that's the type of scale that's relevant to directing policy. But the gaps exist in that is how we're going to achieve this transition. And from a scientific point of view, you can take, this is the debate we had within the group, the social scientists arguing with the natural scientists in particular. It is absolutely valid that you take a scientific view of what are the workable paths to deliver an inclusive, just and timely transition to a sustainable food system. And that should ideally deliver co-benefits for health, the environment, and socio-economic aspects. And that was the kind of question we, we settled on. What lessons can we get from social scientists and humanities to provide options, to produce options or recommendations to help with that in Europe? We know there's a mass of lessons already here. We've got some really good examples of excellent bottom-up initiatives, almost a social movement, I would say. Middle out, we've got some great examples of national programmes, mentioned the Dutch in particular. And then we've got some really good top-down policies and regulation aspirations. And some of the groups we're working with on that, um, like the Policy Brief 31, is a really good example of that, as is Food 2030. So we know what we need to be doing. Um, so the next phase of the work is to hand back over to SAPIR, the European Academies, who are currently running a series of uh, workshops. And the type of the things they're looking at is, what are the barriers to this change? One of the things, um, again coming out from this reference, um, Karina Hawkes and Kelly Parsons, Centre for Food Policy, City University, London, um, most impressed with their, with their work on this. They, they've looked at what, the, what, what, are the, what are the barriers are within government to doing this and how government's affected by all the different businesses, trade and pressures that are, that are on them for the decision making. It's regulatory wise, from regulation point of view, <coughs> from local national policy point of view, it's very complicated and there's lots of competing forces. That takes you into really considering what, the, what is the dominant factors in deciding uh, what policies are and why the food system is currently the shape that it is. And what we find is over, this is from 1900s to 2000s, farmers, turn of the century, last century, were, were, were dominant. They're now very minor players. Manufacturers, food manufacturers, that was 
dominant for a while, now declining. Wholesalers, rapidly declining influence. Retailers have gone from very minor, minor emerging to dominance. So it's the big supermarkets and the like, and the big, uh, uh, and, the, and, the, and, the, and their interests, which is very, very dominant. And within the food, food service, other ways of providing uh, and delivering food, that's also uh, emerging. And this is a UK, um, UK context. Our references at the bottom here. So we start to ask uh, Sapir to go into the, the, so these academies to start to look at these type of issues. Also, there's not just the complexity and the, and the existing power structures, there's also us, there's our behaviours, our ability to actually change um, our behaviours. We've got current diets versus planetary diets. This is one, so the Eat Lancet Commission I referred to earlier, so they describe planetary boundaries and then they show the food types we're not having enough of for health, but we're having too much of uh, for other reasons, uh, for effect on the planet or health. And then we come to last few slides, you'd be glad to know. We end up with uh, why as individuals, we can make a lot of these changes ourselves by driving the demand in a different direction. So this is a rational view of man, Renaissance type here, Leonardo da Vinci, but the reality is far more like this. We as individuals and a society just don't seem to make the sensible choices for our food when we're presented with alternatives, uh, particularly foods which are, you know, salty, sugary, whatever, which is... And we don't want to fall in the same... Well, we want to learn from the lessons of the climate change. This figure just showing the same scientist has been saying since 1990 that climate change is a problem. 2019, he's tapping the mic saying, is this thing on? The message has just not got through. So we've got to work out to get the message through for this transition to a sustainable food system. Um, it is hugely linked with climate change as well, obviously. Final ones here is that uh, this really is one of the greatest, greatest challenges. People <laughs> say, oh, well, climate change is, but the food one incorporates the climate change challenge and it's where it's going to be first felt. We see the reports that some people get concerned when they think about climate change, we get hotter summers. The big issues is the food system, global food system, is going to be disrupted hugely by these changes. It arguably already is being, and that will lead to, lead, could lead to mass migration, starvation, and very often wars. That is the big threat, not that our summers are going to get a little bit too hot, so we're going to need uh, more air conditioning in our homes. So it is probably one of the biggest challenges for, for society for the next few years, which is why I'm... Uh, even though I've officially moved off this topic, I'm staying, staying quite close to it because I'm personally committed to it. Um, lots of high quality analysis has already been done. Always a scope to do more <coughs> of, of, of the detail. This is high level analysis I'm talking about. Um, there is a prospect here of us all having great food, which doesn't impact on the environment, which is really good for us communities and economies. Those things are there that, that can be done. It's all still to play for. We've just got to you know, get, a, get a grip on that. Uh, there does appear to be a significant deficit of uh, social sciences and humanities consideration on, on, these, on these issues. How do you actually get these changes? Um, the European Commission SAM unit uh, is, is, is still running on with its structural report and we're hoping that it will be a major influential factor as will hopefully the, the UK uh, government DEFRA zone. Um, uh, UK government's own policy, which we'll follow in a, a year or so, and it's really hoped that we'll make a big difference. So, thanks very much. It probably was uh, a bit longer than I intended, but um, it is quite a big, big, uh, big topic to cover. So, and don't forget, and vote with your plate. Just things we can do ourselves. Thank you very much. <laughs>